Hey everyone, welcome in to Patterns Tell Stories. I'm your host, Klaus, and today we're going to be talking about the Silurian Hypothesis, Crypto Terrestrials, and Near Death Experiences. With me today, as always, is my co host, Garrett. How's it going, man? Great. I'm glad to be here, man. How are you doing? I'm good. Getting into this uh, kind of weird stuff. There's not really much going on, I think, in the in the current news, um, except for I guess there is. By the time you hear this, there will, there will be a documentary released tomorrow, I believe, with David Grush. We're recording this on Saturday, the thirtieth. So I guess tomorrow, the thirty first, uh, some sort of um, documentary by uh, Yes Theory is yeah is coming out with David Grush. So that should be cool. I guess the one other thing that was interesting this week is that the Department of Energy added a UFO UAP page to their FOIA reading room. I think it probably had to do with the upcoming uh, Schumer legislation. Uh, That's just kind of my speculation where it specifically mentions the Atomic Energy Act uh, in the legislation and the problem of what they call trans classification of documents uh, over to over to the Atomic Energy Commission, I guess back then, which is now the Department of Energy. So part of me feels like they see the writing on the wall with the Schumer legislation and are just kind of trying to get ahead of it um, and say, "Hey, look, we we had a UAP page uh, before you know this was signed into law, so you know we're here in good faith." Which you know they've been fucking covering it up for <laughs> forever, and they've been classifying stuff under DOE. Um, uh classification levels and guides and shit so uh just to keep it out out of foia for the longest time i think it was in the 70s where uh you could just start actually getting foia documents or sending foia requests to the doe so it has <laughs> hasn't been around for for that long but um but yeah it's interesting that they're doing that at this specific time well it's interesting how all these things, not all of them, but a lot of them tie into, uh, as far as we're hearing lately, the Department of Energy. And uh, I, if you guys follow a guy, Christopher Mellon, the former, uh, I think he was the undersecretary of, uh, what the fuck was his job? Was uh, the deputy, I think he was the deputy undersecretary of defense. Defense for intelligence. Maybe intelligence. I think. Yeah. And anyway, Chris Mellon... Uh, when he went on Joe Rogan, I think he's been on a handful of times now, but one of the times he was on Joe Rogan asked him, he's like, where, if you were in charge, where would you go like pounding down the door? And he, the the first thing he said was the department of energy. And I was like, wow. And then you listen to what Grush said to uh, Jesse Michaels. And he's talking about the, uh, the genesis of these programs and guys like Oppenheimer that were like really trying to craft the secrecy of these types of issues the way he was talking about it and the way it's compartmentalized it made it sound like anything that was like had any radiation or anything that was found that has any radiation the department of energy can essentially just come in and be like hey this is now top secret because we found this and it has some sort of radiation that's kind of the way i took the way he was explaining it to jesse so that means that they could have their hands on all sorts of things that they found the uh to try to study and that doesn't necessarily mean anything bad it just means that like the odds are that the mechanisms for keeping these things secret are probably just like kind of waiting in the wings you know what i mean yeah i feel like they just have like uh contingency plans of like when one thing happens or gets revealed or whatever they probably have like a way in place to keep these secrets so uh, it's very fascinating to watch how the like chess match unfolds as different groups get protection. And uh, like, I think that this is going to be one area where we're going to have to hear like the amnesty end of things to actually get a lot of stuff on uncovered. The the reports they put up on the site, I guess they're um, they put up reports of actual incursions of UAP into um, you know, the areas of our nuclear assets and they call them drones, obviously like every, department calls them drones because or i don't know if they said uas in this particular case but uh it's kind of their mo and um in these reports that they put up there's about eight of them i noticed in a lot of them these uap are flashing 
like different colored lights. Um, that's kind of what's reported in a lot of these cases. And I found it like just really odd uh, that that's the kind of behavior they would exhibit if they were trying to actually perform like ISR or uh, reconnaissance on our nuclear facilities. If they, you know, our adversaries were trying to get actual information and, you know, conduct espionage on our nuclear activities, why would they have these, you know, flashing lights going off in, in pretty much like all the cases where people could totally just, you know, locate them in the sky and file file these actual reports that we're seeing now. You'd think that an adversary would be a lot more stealthy, to try to try to minimize their exposure and um, cloak themselves if they wanted to get the most amount of information possible from our, our nuclear sites. So it just doesn't make sense to me why these things are just, you know, making themselves so noticeable. To me, it kind of seems like they might be trying to communicate that they're trying to make their presence known that that someone's watching these nuclear sites as opposed to uh, trying to extract information. If you're trying to get information secretly, you don't fucking show up and have a light show going on. Like, what do you think the odds are that these are Russian or Chinese? What like what percentage of UAP that really have those like six of it's six observables, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think that any of those countries as respectable as their militaries are. I don't think that their militaries are, are a fly fart compared to the United States. So when we have guys say that they don't think that our adversaries have this tech, I believe them. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people would probably roll their eyes and say that's naive. But like when you look at the the badasses and these are badasses that come from all sorts of countries, but they end up working in the United States and for our aerospace. But right. the badasses that go to work for the skunk works or for like uh, some of these aerospace companies, they're no joke. Like they're straight killers, bro. So that, that part of it makes me reassured that it's not Russian or Chinese, but then at the same time, it's like, okay, well, I don't think they're ours because we have generals coming forward and saying that they don't know what they are. So if they were ours, like quote unquote, it's probably in some compartmentalized sketchy ass way. I found it interesting that the science applications, international corporation, SAIC or uh, SAIC. Yeah. SAIC, I guess is what most people call that company. But Tom DeLong's talked about him a lot. Um, Bobby Rainman, who is known to, I've talked about UFO crash retrieval programs in the past was on the board of SEIC. It just makes you think because they're they're one of the biggest contractors for like pretty much all the agencies and then and then particularly like the DOE. They they do a lot of um a lot of studies for for them. And I actually did see, I forget, I think it was in one of the Starfish Prime papers we were talking about last week. The people who that one of the papers was meant for um was SEIC which is interesting. And then, you know, they had the contract to clean up the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster. And I kind of think of it like these craft are anomalous, right? And they uh, cause effects on on human biological tissues. And, you know, they, they affect the brain, the white matter thing with Gary Nolan that he talks about people get too close to these things there's you know radiation burns and all that stuff so these craft are you know giving off all these anomalous signatures and um that's what what Lou Elizondo said when people asked him you know what do ufo's and havana syndrome you know kind of have to do with each other and he said a signature is a signature so it's a very similar uh biological effect you get from that kind of thing and so you'd think like SAIC, you know, as a DOE contractor would would be experienced in in these kind of like radiation effects on the human body. You know, if SAIC is contracted to clean up different sites like Three Mile Island, where there's, you know, all sorts of crazy fucking nuclear uh radiation, you know, it kind of would make sense for, you know, them, maybe not them specifically but but probably uh to be you know maybe a big part of these crash retrieval programs um if you know they're the ones who are experienced with 
with all this this radiation stuff that uh apparently comes with these craft it, it could be a similar um recovery operation and cleanup operation to something like three mile island that's just kind of a thought i had and it kind of uh also one of uh stephen greer's previous witnesses who um i've he's one of the one of the ones i found to be really credible i guess he's kind of made a reemergence as of late i believe it's pronounced wine gant uh jonathan wine gant he kind of was a whistleblower uh for stephen greer who told a story of a crash retrieval operation that he got i guess he touched the craft i think um but he gave a really detailed description of a crash retrieval i believe it was in uh peru uh he he talked about the retrieval team that came and and on the back of all their body suits that that kind of uh keep them safe from radiation they were wearing uh body suits like that and um on the back of them it said doe um yeah department of energy so I mean, that's, you know, one one kind of popular story in the lore that would uh, suggest DOE is definitely involved uh, in at least some of these crash retrieval operations, which would which would make sense considering the uh, biological effects of of these craft and um, the kind of nuclear connection. SAIC, we know, I think we've talked about in previous podcasts, we were talking about remote viewing, how it went out into companies like SAIC instead of being run by the CIA or by the army. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that Joe McMonigle, one of the guys that is constant, I haven't heard one guy involved with any of these programs say a bad thing about Joe McMonigle. Like they all say that he was the man. And apparently he went to go work for SAIC pretty soon after they wrapped up whatever program he was on. And I think he was in the army. So something interesting that Nick Redfern was saying when he went on uh, Coast to Coast and he was talking about uh, Oppenheimer. Apparently Oppenheimer, pretty soon after we had like done the Trinity test and uh, we had dropped the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, only a handful of these bombs had been detonated. Apparently someone had asked Oppenheimer a question and this is in the very, very like early years of the atomic bomb. I'm sure you know that he was like a uh, he was a big proponent of like Indian mysticism. Yeah. And like uh, he he was really into uh, I think they call it the Mahab- Mahabharata um, or mm-hmm. the yep. Bhagavad Gita is how they say it. And uh, anyway, in all these like Vedic texts, Oppenheimer was like uh, pretty into them. And he would constantly like reference them. And there's that famous quote of him saying like, uh, now I am become death, yeah. um, <laughs> which is like a daunting ass line when he says it. Well, anyway, he was asked about uh, nuclear bombs and he answered this question in such a way that made it sound he was, they were like, uh, what do you think these bombs affect is, is on the planet or something? he his response made it sound like it wasn't the first time around that human beings had had a nuclear catastrophe yeah and it was like i wish i knew exactly what he said but i would have to go back to that redfern interview and listen to it but he made he made it sound like uh he said like in recent history yes I was like impressed by the by the size of the bomb. And I was like, wait, what in recent history? What do you mean like in recent history? These are the only ones I thought. And yeah. then you start looking into like guys like Robert Brandenburg, I think his name was. And like then shit just gets really trippy. But yeah, uh, yeah Oppenheimer, he gave this really strange speech. And uh, shout out to Nick Redfern for pointing out pointing that out because I wouldn't have known that. In in the Bhagavad Gita. It mentions magical weapons. Um, I don't know if you know about like that whole ancient nuclear war thing that they pretty much discuss in, in the Bhagavad Gita. Oh yeah, the the stories. That's that's something that Nick Redfern was talking about. Is the stories make it sound like there was absolutely some sort of uh, altercation where these types of weapons were, and they talk about vimanas too. That's yeah. the other phrase you hear thrown around. It's these like flying flying vehicles yep. it's very strange discs, it, literal discs and <laughs> yeah man it's crazy and uh yeah one of the i guess quotes from the actual script is um 
So we, we beheld in the sky what appeared to us to be a mass of scarlet cloud resembling the fierce flames of a blazing fire. From that mass, many blazing missiles flashed and tremendous roars like the noise of a thousand drums beaten at once. And from it fell many weapons winged with gold and thousands of thunderbolts with loud explosions and many hundreds of fiery wheels. <laughs> Goddamn. Yeah, magical weapons called Astra that could destroy entire armies, uh, quote, causing crowds of warriors with steeds and elephants and weapons to be carried away as if they were the dry leaves of trees. The weapon produced an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns that rose in all, all its splendor after corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. Their hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without any apparent cause, and the birds turned white. After a few hours, all the foodstuffs were infected. Any target hit by the Brahmastra would be utterly destroyed. Land would become barren and lifeless. Rainfall would cease, and infertility in humans and animals would follow for eons of time. Oh, my God. Yeah, they talk about big explosions, and then after these explosions, everyone gets sick and has all these issues and problems. That's exactly yeah. what we see in modern context with atomic weapons. As you drop an atomic weapon, it flattens everything, a giant fireball. It's not like, given if you read those stories and think of them as atomic weapons, <laughs> it's it's almost indistinguishable. Like, I don't even know yeah. at this point I, when I read them, I don't even know what else to think of them as because it's such a strange specific, the the way they describe it is so like cut and dry. I feel like. Yeah, it's crazy. And just like Oppenheimer's, you know, interest in uh, research into the Vedic text uh, is such obvious representation of something that sounds exactly like a nuclear war. Got to get the AI to, um, crawl these fucking ancient texts and find this control system. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's kind of it for recent events. I don't know if you can think of anything else, but it was recent enough for me. Cause I didn't know about it. I was rewatching that show unidentified and I like to look at that show because like there's a, it's a, usually the episodes are pretty lengthy mm -hmm. and I, I feel like everything all these people say is valuable and uh, especially guys that I mentioned earlier, like Chris Mellon and Chris Mellon w made this point to say that, like, we need to be putting our energy in the right directions. Right. And I, because that when he said that about Joe Rogan, about the Department of Energy, I was like, oh, it's only a matter of time before we start seeing stuff about the Department of Energy. And like, lo and behold, that's yeah. what started happening. And so I was rewatching Unidentified to see if I could see all the melon parts and see what he said. And he, he started talking about that. We have intelligence apparatus or intelligence gathering apparatus that are 22 and a half thousand miles away from the planet. And he was like, this is far, far, way farther than m most every other uh, orbiting body we have around the planet. And I was like 22 and a half. So I like Googled, that distance mm -hmm. and like satellite to see what was because it's only probably a handful and boom bro the first thing that came up was this uh i think it was the national it was noaa the national yep. oceanic and atmospheric association or something and they have this satellite called discover and apparently this satellite is capable i i guess they use it for like weather and all sorts of shit like that but like this satellite can see so much like it was one of the most impressive things that i've ever read about in terms of like things that are in space yeah. it got me really pumped and uh because i knew he did but he didn't say it outright but then yeah. when i looked into a uh, different legislation that is being discussed one of the uh organizations that they were demanding transparency from was the noa and i was like oh boy like what are they gonna say they're seeing in our oceans or like going in and out of our because that dude out of any of the satellites that we have that one is probably like one of the most fascinating to like really get into the nitty-gritty of what it's picking up tim tim Gallaudet, i believe he uh he was in the Navy and then I think NOAA. Um, and he he's kind of come out and started talking about, you know, UAP and 
things were kind of being covered up, uh, he he ran into at least one situation where there was a UAP event, and then you know whoever was in control or or higher up on on the on the ladder in the Pentagon basically came down and like deleted all all their fucking emails about it, which is crazy. He was on yeah Ryan Graves podcast uh, merged. Um, I think he's definitely someone to watch going forward on this. NOAA is uh, definitely has the capabilities to see if anything is really going on in the ocean. If if these craft are indeed you know originating from there, or at least like have temporary base or something like that underwater. And you brought up yeah, you brought up uh, unidentified. I don't know if you've watched the new um, Steven Spielberg produced. Well, his his production company put out uh, Encounters on Netflix, which is a UFO documentary. That's um, really, really well done. I don't know if you saw that. No, I saw Diana Pasolka. It, it's called Encounters, right? Yep. Yeah. Diana Pasolka was tweeting about it. And yeah, I she's in the she's in the fourth episode. She was she was. Oh, pretty what? Good. Yeah, she was nice. Good. I didn't know that. I, I I'm it's on my list, but it, I didn't really know what it was or I hadn't put a lot of attention into it yet. But it's good. You heard it was like pretty solid. Yeah, I watched it. Um it, it, it's good. It's really insanely well done, obviously, for you know Spielberg production. Um, you'd expect that. But uh it kind of isn't anything new for us. Uh it's just presented in a really nuanced way, um, which is nice. It's it's you know, well edited and well put together and entertaining, you know, for better or worse, there's a few aspects to it that might have been better if they had left out just when it comes to the credibility of the subject. Like in the last episode, someone was like, I'm an alien. That could have just not been in there. Um, and it wouldn't have, uh, <laughs> you know, been any worse, uh, any worse off, but it, it was really good. The other gripe I had was had to do with the aerial school uh, episode. I, everyone's kind of talking about it, so I don't th- really think it's a spoiler. But in the aerial school episode, they included a former student who he basically said he tricked everyone. He tricked you know sixty students who claim they saw this thing. He he claims it was you know he made a joke, and uh, they all just it like triggered false memories in their heads, and they all just like collectively. Uh, hallucinated this alien spaceship or something just because and he, just because he came up with a clever joke it it was really weird uh and kind of off-putting and he was rather off-putting in in the way he was he was presenting it he was basically it's basically like if mick mick west like smoked crack and like yelled at people from his childhood <laughs> it's like <laughs> he's basically it's like, yeah, I don't know how these people believe this stuff. They're just stupid. Aliens don't exist. And he really wasn't eloquent in any way. And he just came off as a total asshole. Maybe it was actually better that he was in it because it made skeptics look like fucking douchebags. But um, it was just kind of an unpleasant addition to the whole aerial school, you know, story and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I cursed him out on Twitter because I was, I was like this <laughs> nice (laughs) and fun fact like uh, yeah it was basically fuck this guy (laughs) this weasley ass motherfucker and um like super super abrasive and uh (laughs) and you know who liked that tweet diana (laughs) pasolka hell yeah (laughs) yeah so funny i'm like oh man so sick I didn't yeah. know that. She just went up like three points in my book. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's <was> funny. Um, <laughs> so yeah, check out Encounter. Spielberg doesn't need the money for me to plug this to you know <laughs> anyone on here. But but yeah, check it out. It's cool. Um, I it's worth sharing. Actually, my uh, one of my family members who he's he's actually a pilot, and uh, he saw the back in February when the um. Chinese balloon was was floating over the country and that whole you know crazy what are we doing about the balloon uh thing was going on he actually uh saw the balloon he was in the air um and it, and it went by him and he actually took a video of it which is which is pretty cool but uh he he texted me uh, a few days ago and was like hey did you did you see this on Netflix uh how how was it basically asking my opinion and um I told him it was it was good. It was worth watching. It was entertaining. And he definitely liked the first episode, which is the Stevensville, you know, UFO encounter where they were like 
hundreds of people who witnessed this thing and radar data and all that stuff. So if you watch that, it's pretty convincing the way they the way they put that together. Yeah, it's cool that <laughs> having my my pilot family member ask me about a UFO documentary. Did, did he? Uh, what is his opinion on these things? Like, what does he think they are? He doesn't. No. And I mean, he asks me my opinion all the time. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I study this shit like all day, every day, but I have no <laughs> answers. And uh, there's just so much bullshit that fills in the cracks that, you know, there's there's no answers. So it's it's nice when a documentary like that comes out and presents it in a way that's not like crazy conspiratorial. The series just tells of people's experiences. And they had uh, this Navy uh, cryptographer who... I guess was on the on the Roosevelt during the gimbal uh, event, which was interesting. And he kind of, I guess, took something home. He talked about a kind of hitchhiker effect. And yeah, I don't know. That was pretty interesting. And it, it's just weird to think about like this te- this technology causing some sort of um, hitchhiker phenomena. Do you know if Gary Nolan has ever talked about the hitchhiker effect or like given a hypothesis on what he thinks it is or why that happens? Or has he, it's okay if you don't know. I was just curious. I, I'm sure he has. And I'm sure it's probably pretty close to anything Colm, Colm Kelleher has said. Uh, he referenced, I think it's his name is Bernard Kastrup in one of his papers about the hitchhiker effect. And he, he was talking about the default mode network, which, which Gary has brought up before. So I think there's a similar view that it might have something to do with yeah, the DMN um, in the brain. It's really fascinating because uh, these biology guys seem <laughs> at the extremes seem to start to drift into studying consciousness. Yeah, and uh, like I sent you that uh, I think yesterday when it was Francis Crick and uh, James Watson, the guys who like discovered the double helix structure DNA, and uh, they're given this interview and they're asking, uh, I think they're asking Crick to explain what he's been up to. And he said that, like, he spent loads of time looking at consciousness and trying to understand, like, uh, the foundation of reality. It's fascinating to me how things start to drift into that consciousness area in all these areas as you get to the extremes, like in uh, any subject. I'm interested to see how that unfolds when it comes to, like, our understanding of some of these ideas that seem like particularly difficult to prove because they're like, uh, they happen so rarely that I feel like they're not as repeatable as scientists would like. A lot of the information they get ends up like, depending on what they're doing, there's something John Alexander talked about a lot is that like when they would study stuff out at Skinwalker, they would get valuable information but it was never the information they were testing for. And it was always stuff that was just <laughs> ran- erroneous, random shit that would happen during these experiments. And it was something that would like give them ideas sort of as to like what to study next. But half the time it was always out of left field because he was talking about that, that idea of precognitive sentient phenomena. Mm-hmm. And he was saying that like this, whatever this is, it's one step ahead of us. Yeah. And, uh, they would it would made it really difficult to try to test these things scientifically yeah to add on to that i saw something in nature is it a magazine or i know it's a a academic journal but um by i guess like 126 or so uh scientists wrote a open letter essentially calling the integrated information theory of consciousness pseudoscience and this is a theory that has been put forward by some very credible like neuroscientists and um it's a thought out theory that um i guess is, it's been gaining traction in the media and a bunch of these you know scientists like were kind of sick of seeing it in the media and so they were, yeah they they got together and signed this letter basically uh exclaiming this theory to be pseudoscience like labeling it that officially which i think is like one of the craziest fucking anti-scientific things you can do uh especially like when it comes to the study of human consciousness like where how do you even have like the data to say anything about anything being pseudoscience like we don't even know where to start 
studying human consciousness and the fact that you would like take such a well thought out and um created by by credible people you would take that off the table because you're just sick of hearing about it in the media and it and their main reason was like it can't be empirically tested and it's like no shit man like <laughs> it's, a, it's a theory of consciousness you know so we throw out all theories of consciousness because they can't be tested and we call it we, do we call consciousness itself pseudoscience, like the study of consciousness? It's a, it's just so bizarre to me that there's like such reactionary like factions within the scientific community that would come out and just basically cross things off a list when there's no no actual reason to. It's it's a fucking theory of consciousness. I I don't get it, but uh, yeah, that kind of reminded me of that. So so thanks for bringing that up. All of these arguments of authority, meaning like. Oh, well, the scientific board of such and such says that we're not going to give any credibility to this idea. Any like that type of stuff is baloney. At the end of the day, science depends on evidence and the consciousness people know that guys like Edgar Mitchell knew that, that like we need to gather data regardless of the stigma that's around us. Um, we need to gather data and come up with like experiments and things to try to study these complicated ideas and we're probably not going to get uh, embraced right off the bat because this is very new. And anytime you try anything new, you're going to fail at it. All these guys that I see go to study consciousness like really deeply. Um, Sam Harris is another one of them. All these guys understand that like these ideas are difficult, but the people have to spend time thinking about them because like we are making progress regardless of any what anybody says on these topics uh regarding consciousness i think that they've made a lot more progress than you would think dude one example is how put off talking uh to jesse michaels about uh anesthesia and i think he asked him about stuart hammeroff or he 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 asked him about like essentially how put off was like oh well if we know what mechanism in the brain anesthesia makes unconscious maybe that mechanism has something to do with consciousness like he he broke it down very simply and made it sound like uh this is something that uh, at, and uh, at like very deep levels that uh scientific community today is just a little late to the party compared to the black world right. of like this type of scientific research because the people that are in that world like how put off talk about consciousness like it's like uh something that we're we're pretty comfortable studying you know whereas mm -hmm. people that aren't really involved with those types of ideas a lot of the time they will poo poo it and make it sound like it's something that like only the fringe will study and it, and it's i feel like it's kind of part of the problem with um science today too and lavenda has talked about how it makes it kind of tricky to attack the you know studying the phenomenon from a multidisciplinary uh perspective because science today is just so compartmentalized in itself uh every field is just so specifically you know honed in on uh certain aspects of science and there's no like general broad kind of philosophical connection between all the different sciences it's it's just kind of everyone's in their own corner and not really paying attention to what to what's going on in other aspects and i think that is, is also an analogy for what's going on with um you know reverse engineering this this ufo stuff and why they might not be having so much success with it is that all these different compartments are not you know getting information from from the others so they can't you know maybe they don't have the newest um data or the you know latest analysis on, on these technologies because they're just so they're not talking to each other so um yeah it's kind of funny that that our scientific community outside of the classified world would would reflect the same kind of dynamic and yeah you were talking about consciousness and that kind of uh segues into the next thing we wanted to talk about which is the study that came out uh on near-death experiences um there's an article on it in vice magazine titled uh People experience new dimensions of reality when dying, groundbreaking study reports. So I'm just going to read a little bit of this, So, and then we'll just kind of go from there. Um, so the article starts out, 
Scientists have witnessed brain patterns in dying patients that may correlate to commonly reported near-death experiences, such as lucid visions, out-of-body sensations, a review of one's own life, and other quote-unquote dimensions of reality, reports a new study. EEG brain signals captured from dozens of the patients revealed that episodes of heightened consciousness occurred up to an hour after cardiac arrest. The most of the patients in the study were sadly not resuscitated by CPR. 53 patients were brought back to life. Of the survivors, 11 patients reported a sense of awareness during CPR, and six reported a near-death experience. Parnia and his colleagues suggest that the transition from life to death can trigger a state of disinhibition in the brain that, quote, appears to facilitate lucid understanding of new dimensions of reality including people's deeper consciousness, all memories, thoughts, interactions, and actions towards others from a moral and ethical perspective. From their own inner perspective, they find that they're fully conscious. They have an inner experience, and their consciousness is not only there, but it's heightened to a level that they've never experienced before. When you look at the recalled experience of death, and these were actually among a global po population, the themes were all consistent. Our conclusion is that this is a real experience that emerges only with death. As we transition from life to death, somehow this experience occurs. We're discovering essentially what happens to us all when we go through death, what happens to our consciousness. So this is straight up like life after death science. Dude, I think that they know this shit and have known about it. Like Robert, dude, Robert Bigelow works with John Alexander, who's like the master of this shit. He knows, dude, in my opinion, Robert Bigelow is has enough money, dude. He, Robert Bigelow's probably died like eight times and has like <laughs> <laughs> paid to like have himself fucking go into the DMT world. And like, <laughs> I'm obviously joking. I think no, that like uh, the thing, I, I just think that like that's really cool to hear. I'm glad that that was written in a way that didn't sound ridiculous. Um, this shit is crazy, bro. You talk, we're talking about what happens when you die. I just think it's kind of funny because like, you know, everyone's like, oh, Bigelow's doing all the, you know, this crazy consciousness thing where, you know, ignore him. He's a he's a fucking loon. And then, you know, an article like this comes out. It's like about a peer reviewed paper that's telling you that there's <laughs> there's another dimension of reality that people are experiencing with with these NDEs. And it's just kind of like, yeah, that's a good point. The I, I should say this about Robert Bigelow. I have to give him props because he held an essay contest and I think he awarded it was either like a hundred or five hundred thousand dollars to the top essay that would prove that there is the existence of life continuing after physical death I think was the way he phrased yeah. it and Jeffrey Mishlove actually won like Jeffrey Mishlove, dude, I don't know if anyone's anyone out there that's interested in this shit look up Jeffrey Mishlove's award-winning entry and it was like, a hundred pages of just his interviews and like his research into these areas of near-death experiences. And he, I, he had like 12 different areas that proved his idea. And uh, I thought that it was super interesting at the very least. I didn't walk away from it. Like <laughs> feeling like I had had to join some group or whatever. I was just like, uh, <laughs> I, I, after reading it and listening to the interviews and stuff, it seems like there's certainly something to these areas of study, like near-death experiences. Yeah, Mishlove just interviewed Bigelow. He did a series of interviews. And one of the stories that, that Bigelow talked about was, I guess, a pilot, like an Air Force pilot in the was was doing some sort of experiment in a centrifuge, which I guess is, I, I'm not really sure what that is specifically i think it's like a machine that like spins around like yeah a crazy amount like and and you experience like certain g's and like you kind of train yourself to uh you know be able to withstand that kind of pressure yeah i guess one of the stories uh he told was about an air force pilot that had just like done an insane amount of g's in a centrifuge and he got out he, his consciousness basically left his body floated up into like the ceiling and the guy like watched his body as he he followed it down down the hall and like went through walls and um you know basically once his body sat down after going through the hall hallway his consciousness like snapped back into it which 
<laughs> just like, yeah, he watched himself walk down the hallway and then just like be- went back into his body after like spinning around and <laughs> fucking like however many G's they do uh, to train jet pilots train to uh, to withstand, which makes it really interesting and and kind of makes sense why um, you know if that's any sort of true where they're having these out of body experiences uh, during these kind of experiments, um, it makes sense why there's actual, you know, air force studies into aspects of consciousness because, uh, Gary Nolan talks about how, how these people are very high functioning, have extra connections in certain areas of the brain that are, are responsible for executive function and that kind of thing. So I know that Jim Semivan has talked about DMT before, right? How, how do you think that like near death experiences and like a DMT trip differ and how are they similar? Because I hear similar shit from what people describe, but the DMT seems much more like geometric. I don't even know how to describe it. It's not, it seems like the death ones, all the death stories I hear, not all of them. I hear all sorts of fucking crazy stories. So I, I hate to paint with a broad brush, but a lot of the time, near death stories are like uh tunnels of light right. and uh, are seeing a loved one or seeing god or seeing whatever but like light usually flash before your eyes which is yeah, kind of what exactly. that's kind of what this uh article is talking about but yeah sorry go ahead. yeah i'm i'm just curious because one of the th- the points that jim semivan made about dmt was that you can only be in that state for so long until it's no longer feasible and you snap back into it and that's something that I, I hear about, like inducing that state with a drug like DMT, or there's something of like people have the actual ND themselves. I'm, I'm curious because I haven't, tr- I haven't had a near death experience and I've never really tried DMT. So I feel like I'm a horrible person to speculate yeah, me on either, it. So. But <laughs> yeah, thank God though. I mean, I mean, <laughs> just off the top of my head, it, it sounds like, you know, maybe hallucinogenics are a cheat code of some kind and maybe you know all those geometric patterns are just a artifact of you know the method using to reach that level of consciousness because dmt i scares the fucking shit out of me honestly like i have never done it specifically out of how much the fear like i i just what, what do you mean why is it scary it, because isn't it naturally like occurring in our brains i thought that our brains make dmt i guess um, just the fact that you're seeing entities and it's like reported that you're definitely going to fucking see these things. And it, I don't want to, I like, I don't need new friends. Like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have honestly like straight up, like when I have seen certain things in the sky, like I get, I get like this primordial sense of fear. Like it, it's so I don't know why there's just something about that connection to something that I it's, it's weird. I I can't explain it. So putting myself in a situation where, you know, everyone reports like these beings in, in whatever dimension. And some people even, you know, report having both people having the same experience with the same beings like that at the same time, that's, that's been reported. It's, and they, and they, you know, do it separately. They both do DMT. Um, you know, on their own separately and don't talk about it, but they, they end up seeing the, the exact same, you know, beings, which scares the shit out of me. Cause it's like, okay, this might actually be another dimension of reality. And, um, I don't know, I guess Tom DeLong talks about it in, in a way that, you know, maybe it's beautiful. I'm just not ready for that kind of uh, experience, I guess is, and I don't want to interact with something that I don't, I don't know what, what it is. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking it, but, uh, yeah, Tom talks about it when, when you do ayahuasca, it basically opens up your antenna and like your, you know, your whole body, your spine, your rib cage, your, your skull, it's all one antenna. Like it's shaped for that specific purpose. Um, he also says like, when you, when you do ayahuasca and you, and you travel to whatever, you know, whatever plane this existence uh, happens to to be on um that you see these these beings and and then he calls them ai if if these beings are non-physical representations of ai um i 
I just don't know what kind of intentions or, uh, you know, how they would react to someone coming through to their side of the veil. In my opinion, it, it depends on exactly what the nature of these experiences are. My my understanding is a lot of the time when people like see the quote unquote DMT elves, um, like Joe Rogan is a real famous example, and he talks about it quite a bit. And he says that like uh, a lot of the time they are doing and saying things that like also align with the rhythms of your body. So like he said, he could like feel his heart beating like ba 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 ba, and they were going like I love you, I love you, oh and they were like it's playing with him. <laughs> and like what the fuck? Yeah, who wants that? Really, I don't get it. I don't, I don't know, dude. It could be fun. I don't know. I want to. Sounds say, like a fucking nightmare, yeah, like literal to... <laughs> nightmare. I would have like fucking oh god. Dude, but what if they could get down? Like what else could they? say? I don't care. I don't if care they, if they were positive. <laughs> what else could they say? I think uh, I got enough I don't problems, bro. I don't need like. <laughs> Jesus, that's just asking for like reoccurring, like fucking traumatic nightmares. Because I, don't... Cause I well, I've also here's the thing. I've also done salvia. Uh, oh like, really? What a, was what was that like? Fucking gravity bong, and it was a nightmare. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. It was an experience, but it was awful. And uh, I, I. Ugh, I don't even know how to explain it. It's basically like the universe was getting ripped in half and it, for about two seconds. And it was like so fucking intense. And like, I don't know. I just did it after school one day. And I, mean, I was like fucking <laughs> 14 years old because it was legal. I just had like this fucking, oh God. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, never do it again. But yeah, I don't know. I guess that may be turning me off to it, but I just, I don't know. I just don't need fucking machine elves in my life right now. That's uh... <laughs> I get that, dude. The you know? thing is though, is like, you have to, you're, I feel like you're in that battle, not you specifically. I'm just saying like one, yeah. uh, uh, one is in that battle of like, are they just talking to themselves or am I actually talking to something? Is this thing telling me shit that I really wouldn't have known? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that's a, I wanted to read you this little blurb in my notes about Terrence McKenna when he's talking about this. Uh, he's talking about psilocybin in this example, but he's talking about like this teaching. That I can handle. He That's called fun. it. Okay, <laughs> here we go. So he says, like, so what I find and what I think is generally part of the shamanic practice of taking mushrooms is that at fairly low doses, meaning I can't speak of pure psilocybin, but at five dried grams, it's very easy to invoke a voice, a kind of logos-like phenomena, which operates as the typical hierophant. It's the teaching voice. It's Virgil to Dante. It's a very large and superior force which takes you by the hand and then narrates the various scenarios that you're conveyed through so that you can have some validation that you're not just talking to the back of your head. And though this sounds trivial at first, as you move into the dialogue with the other, it becomes apparent that it's going to be elusive. Mercurial is a word that suggests itself. Mercury is a, is a substance in alchemy that if you add it to any ore, it extracts the gold out of that ore, right? So he was saying that this mushroom experience was mercurial by nature, meaning that it can you can lose the meaning of it very easily if you misinterpret it. But if you use it as a tool and try to extract the quote gold out of the experience, then you can actually benefit. That it makes sense that that would be the difference because when I did salvia, it was like I'm depressed. I want to get fucked up, so I'm gonna rip this legal weed. Basically, that, that <laughs> you know that was my you know awesome uh, thought process going into salvia. So I'm sure that didn't help, but I think salvia is just probably a nightmare regardless but <laughs> but yeah i mean i'm sure dmt is can be very very fun well not fun but just a very spiritual experience and you know kind of life-changing is is what i hear from most people who do it and you obviously don't understand the experience unless you do take it and that's why i think microdosing is cool is because you're kind of going bit by bit kind of tweaking your 
brain into these different um, different wirings, and you don't have to go meet these horrifying creatures in another realm. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe I'll, yeah, microdosing sounds like a better uh, option for me. Um, but speaking of AI and aliens and yeah, terrible segue, but um, I guess there's these AI parody shows on YouTube, <laughs> you know, it's a show with all the settings and they're, these are, they're animated. I guess one's like SpongeBob. It's, it's like an AI simulated uh parody of a tv show so one of them spongebob and i guess one, one day back in june ai squidward uh whatever this is based off of i think it might be chat gpt but uh he started going off about how universal like the the heat death of the universe was going to happen in august 2036 um he just kept repeating that no one knows why and it was freaking out all the fucking people who are watching it i guess Squidward states that the heat death is an event where the universe becomes so hot that all matter is destroyed. Apparently, this will be caused by the god of destruction known as angel dust. Uh, luckily, Squidward also provided a solution. According to him, in order to prevent the heat death, we must provide angel dust with human sacrifices. <laughs> Fucking... What? <laughs> <laughs> dude you didn't mention that part of the story i know i thought i'd surprise you bring in bring in lavenda and dude. Uh, yeah. oh my god what <laughs> squidward dude what did he, when See, what this was is what the... happens when you put the ai into the ancient text they're gonna spit back heat death in 2036 and uh, human sacrifice yeah it's crazy so i don't know what caused uh this ai to make that conclusion and um you know come up with that solution to such a fucking insane uh when, when i read things like this i'm like well yeah I, it's just funny thinking about like everyday things if, if this shit was real dude but you can't you, you can't let that <laughs> dude that one's wild you can't you can't let that one get you worked up at all what do you any, dude, any I'm, them, no i'm not saying I, this has nothing to do with dmt i'm like <laughs> dude <laughs> I just think back to Mothman prophecies right. and like uh, the reason why John Keel got so worked up about these prophecies is because a lot of them came true continuously. Right. And John, John Keel thought that the world was going to end. He thought it was going to end in like the sixties or so, maybe early seventies after that bridge collapsed in point pleasant, he was really spooked because these weird mechanical voices were telling him all these things that were happening. Apparently they predicted Martin Luther King and uh, Robert Kennedy and like all sorts of like really specific, horrific things. And uh, John Keel was ready to head for the hills. And uh, he thought that the world was ending. And that seems to be, at wh however way you slice it, it seems like a common theme is that like a lot of people that have some sort of experience say that like they get some sort of prophecy of like their part in some giant picture. You know what I mean? Like you have this like special part of uh, this prophecy that's about to unfold. and. I dude, how many of them haven't come true? Like people have predicted so many times that the world was going to end, and like they never fucking happen. Yeah. And I think that that's like kind of the the idea is that like maybe that shit is just to get us stirred. Not Squidward. Squidward <laughs> is cool. I don't know why the fuck Squidward said all that stuff. It's but not cool anymore. It, 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 said, it sent me on a tangent, <laughs> and I have to explain this. So John, <laughs> please. Dude, so maybe <laughs> that these these technologies, like maybe even Squidward, bro, maybe that these technologies have uh like deep down there is some sort of consciousness trying to communicate. Right. And uh they just do it through Squidward and through uh <laughs> dude, you can't put this in the podcast. Oh, I'm totally keeping this shit in the podcast. It's so funny. <laughs> terrifying and uh i've been thinking about it a lot even though i shouldn't but it is yeah um uh, god damn it what does heat death mean what does that mean oh god you don't want to know <laughs> oh god <laughs> it's, Dude. 
Yeah, that doesn't even make sense. Of. Heat death is it's actually like a physics thing. Let me look it up. The heat death of the universe is a hypothesis on the ultimate fate of the universe, which suggests the universe will evolve to a state of therm- thermodynamic free energy um, and will therefore be unable to sustain processes that increase entropy. Oh, dude, we're good. Yeah, man. <laughs> dude, we got plenty of time. That Okay, we're good, dude. Yeah, Even re- if- refinance your mortgage. <laughs> Things are going to be great. Dude, this is- <laughs> Most scientists disagree with Squidward. Um, safe, <laughs> safe to say that it will not be in 2036. But um, yeah, time is an illusion. So who knows? yeah man that i think we should end it there it was pretty good good episode dude um you got anything coming up you want to plug yeah i'm gonna have a new article coming out in the next two weeks so people should be on the lookout for that and uh just as a reminder to people who really enjoy this podcast when you share it or comment on it or ask us a question or something it is awesome like I absolutely, it makes my day. Yeah, so really like, does. um, when you do do that, don't feel like it's just kind of shooting into the wind. We do read it and we really appreciate it. So if you guys, um, whenever this podcast drops, if you guys want to share it and like it and subscribe or whatever app you're listening to, it really means the world. Yeah, because rate it, like, that's the thing. yeah, rate it five stars and like really, uh, yeah, or, it means or one the world star. <laughs> Or one, if you don't like <laughs> us talking about Squidward, then like <laughs> in his prophecies, then yeah, just I rate guess. It. But uh, yeah, it really does mean the world. So yeah, no, because I, like I do, because because I used to listen to podcasts and kind of like consider, you know, I consider them kind of my friends, and uh, you know, it's just nice to like meet up once a week, and um, I don't know, that's kind of the thing in my mind that that I'm trying to to bring to the community is just. Um, just like a casual conversation where you can like, you know, actually enjoy um the subject and not have to deal with all the bullshit that's on on Twitter or like, you know, even just general ufology. It's just I just want people to feel like they're, you know, part of the conversation and we're just shooting the shit. And um, yeah, man, I think we're good. Thanks everyone for uh coming in and uh we'll see you again next week. <laughs>